Welcome everyone to Talking God's Grace. It's Frank here and uh, today's episode, <clears throat> excuse my throat, it's a bit uh, rough, a bit sore, a bit sore from coughing and uh, I've got a bit of a cold. <clears throat> but um, saying that, I've got my tea, so I'm going to be reading a little bit of information to you. But today's topic is going to be very important. We're going to be looking at the centrality, the role of the governing body, pastors, leadership, popes, whatever. <clears throat> um, is their position, even elders, right, this office, as it were, is this biblical? You know, my old organization, they would say, well, there was a governing body in the first century, right, uh, a leadership that had oversight over all the brothers and they'll point to things like um, <clears throat> where they needed some money and um, you know that account in Acts chapter 5 about Ananias right that might be a familiar account they'll say well there was men who were in charge of this <clears throat> or in Acts 15 where there's a decision to be made uh, about the grace message, about the gospel. What type of gospel are we preaching? Are we preaching a works-based gospel or is a grace-based gospel? You know, you may recall Acts 15.1, it starts off by saying, um, you know, they weren't happy, some of these Judean believers or not, weren't happy with Paul's message to the Gentiles about a grace message that didn't require any works to be saved just to believe in Jesus. Acts 15, 1 tells you the start of that, where they went down, right? They went where Paul was preaching in Antioch, I think it was, or in that area. <clears throat> and they confronted these believers and saying, hey, it's good that you believe in Jesus, but you need to be circumcised, right? And that started this, the ball rolling for everybody to get together, especially the apostles and those Jews in Jerusalem, because obviously in their mind, they're thinking, well, you need to get circumcised. So there must have been some division there because what Paul received was from the Lord Jesus, this gospel message. And that's what he was preaching. And so what happened? Well, there was a meeting. They gathered together. And so they talked about which gospel are we preaching? I mean, what is the gospel? Is it this or is it that? Is it works-based or is it just faith alone, belief alone in Jesus without your works? Well, as we learned in that chapter, it is without your works. They accepted what, Je what Paul received from Jesus was correct, was, the, was uh, current, <clears throat> and that's what they should all follow. Um, and so because of this meeting, right, this one-off meeting, you don't see it ever again, uh, which was right. I mean, they all should be there because they're all apostles and you know they're alive and they're around and you know, this made sense that they all gathered together to hear what Paul had to say, Paul and Barnabas. But <clears throat> because of this, people have made this office of the governing body a reality, you know. So the centrality of the governing body, let's ask the question, or the role of the pastor or the pope or church leadership, whatever, is it biblical? When we look at his, the history of institutional Christianity that has brought us this office, right? These office, these men where they sit now in these offices, this is what we have today. <clears throat> um, what is it? it? It is a top-down authority structure where the governing body, as we see today, or the pastor, or the elders, or the pope, or whoever it is, they have been handed this authority, power, um, over the flock that cannot be questioned. So how did we get to where we are today in this institutional religion, organization, church, whichever one you want to call it, culture where it's so firmly planted that the role of these men have now been like established as almost it is biblical. And this is how it was done. And this is how it should be done. <clears throat> That's part one. We're going to learn a little bit today about part one. 
in this. This is a two-part series. The two, second part series, we're going to answer these questions. What has the centuries of pastor-centered, governing body-centered, elder-centered practices done to the body of Christ? Why is the institution of this person or group of people or whoever so centered? Why is that the case? Now, how's, has their role, has their role now, this office that's been created, pastor, governing body, elders, whatever you want to call them, right? Have they contributed to the crippling of the body of Christ? And do pastor, governing body, elders, ministerial servants, whatever you want to call them, elders, right, bishops, <clears throat> centered practices enhance or hinder the functioning of the body of Christ? Is their role, this, this group role, whether it's one elder or pastor or it's a group of men, the top-down authority, their centrality, the focus on them, what is, I mean, is this is what is this what Jesus had in mind? And who put these men in charge anyway? <clears throat> but that's part two. Today we're just looking at part one. And you can see why people today have become disillusioned with institutional churches, religions, organizations, as my former one, Jehovah's Witnesses, and are leaving these organizations, churches, and religions, right? These Christian religions. <clears throat> when you look at the stats, uh, a large number who have left are leaving not because they don't love Jesus or God or the Father, no, but because they feel that the institutional religion or church um, has, has deviated from, from what um, Christianity or what Jesus actually brought truth to people they've deviated from jesus why jesus message the gospel in its simplicity <clears throat> but let's look at <coughs> some of the texts that help us to see where it all sort of went what texts uh, people use and some of the comments from the early church fathers how exactly all this began not surprisingly, the New Testament talks about pastors, it does. That is one time. It's found in Ephesians 4.11. Paul reminds us the gifts God has given to the church or the ecclesia for the specific purpose of building itself up in love. He says this, <clears throat> And he gave the apostles, and he gave Jesus, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, Ephesians 4.11, that's where you find it. Some translations, of course, don't use the word shepherds. <clears throat> um, but when you see there in the context describing the body of Christ, um, of course, do your own research. You'll see that some other translations use the word pastors instead of shepherds. <clears throat> so it's up to you, like NIV, I think, NASB and King James Version may read pastors. Uh, the body of Christ has been given pastors, shepherds, teachers, etc., evangelists, for equipping and building up of itself in love, the body itself in love. That's why they're there. They're gifts. It was never an office. It was a gift. <clears throat> Interestingly, this is the only time in the New Testament where this gift you know, sequence of gifts has been mentioned outside of what uh, Jesus speaks. And there's nothing here, when you look at it in Ephesians 4.11, there's nothing there describing any specific thing or office um, regarding the building up and the equipping is to be done or what it is to look like. So there's nothing to follow that, right? So what's happened is they've taken this one verse and turned it into something. Like a lot of twisting of scripture do, do uh, with individuals, uh, religious individuals. <clears throat> We've, or they, in the early years, institutionalized this one role 
right? The pasta was a big deal back in the first, second, second century when it started to become a thing, an office, and made, them, made that role into something bigger than that it ever should have been. <coughs> so a lot of people today, you see a lot of churches, they'll have pastors as their leading head, you know, a lead pastor. In fact, my old religion, Jehovah's Witnesses, the head of that organization or the person who started that up, he called himself pastor. He called himself Pastor Russell. <clears throat> it was a thing, you know. It was an office. It wasn't just, you know, um, I'm a teacher. You know, I'm a, I have this gift. It was an actual office. <clears throat> and, you know, they've been elevated, these people, especially in the Western society, you know, in, in church structure in Western. They've become this central figure. They've been provided a platform where people will look to them for guidance and uh, whatever it is, right? Uh, they've been elevated above the rest of the flock. Um, some, you know, in some places, you know, they they become a business themselves. They've got they they're writing their own books, and uh, you know, um, they become a celebrity in some uh, in current uh, form. <coughs> Usually when these people speak or pastors or elders or governing body or whatever, it's usually a one-way discussion, isn't it? They talk and you listen, you accept. Um, and what that does is put a greater distance between them and the flock, right? Uh, most religions will only have their way of uh, worship, Usually it's the top-down system, right? Top-down structure where the certain ones are taking the lead, as, a, as they say, we're taking the lead. They'll have elders taking the lead. But this is the office of the elder or the office of the bishop or pastor or whoever. <clears throat> then they'll have their understudies or their helpers or their clerical staff or whichever you want to put it. And under their direction, they then are told, how to run how to run the, the the local group or congregation or the church that they're from so this pastor this role that's been created is under a, a lot of pressure uh, from both uh, you know within its own its own um, institution that it's been created and with with those that they're now communicating the message whatever that message is. <clears throat> so it's in a way, it's put a, um, a lot of pressure on these guys. It's really unfair that they actually have this office. It, 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 the body doesn't work this way, where the, you know, um, this, there's a centrality of a person or a group of people who are now in charge or taking the lead. I can use that word because that's how they like to express it, but really they're in charge of everybody else. There is only one leader, Jesus said, <clears throat> and that's him. But the journey to where these guys are, this leadership, where do you think it all began? <clears throat> well, when we think about the apostolic fathers, now they've, they've been given a lot of um, authority from modern day uh, leaders, they'll use the Apostolic Fathers as a, a springboard into whatever is going on today, right? In, in any doctrines or whatever, you, usually they'll say, well, the, the Fathers thought this, and some of them thought that, whatever it was. But if you go back to the second century, those some of those guys overlapped with the Apostles, okay? And so they were definitely influenced by the apostles and the, the, the gifts in men back then. They were close associates and probably some were close associates to the 12 individually. Now, one such person, uh, if we can mention his name, was Ignatius of Antioch. Antioch was a very popular congregation. Paul came out of there and so on. So Ignatius of Antioch died around 110 A.D., so he was right in the mix, right? 
he was a pastor or a bishop <coughs> excuse me in the church of Antioch um, and so let's see what he has to say about this role excuse me <coughs> now of course just a little bit of background he had a love for Jesus obviously and the congregation himself um, he wanted to see unity because back then there was a lot of uh, divisions in the, in the body of Christ. And that's, you know, funny enough, when you read the New Testament, friends, don't you see that? Don't you see it's very messy? Right? Have you ever stopped and thought this yourself? Oh, it's messy. Jesus is dealing with a lot of messy. Uh, and yet people are saying, and yet the, the thing that binds that mess is love. Right? But, you, you know, you notice in uh, Christianity, it's all, it's all uh, depends which flavor you're in or which group you, you're in. Let's say you're group A. Well, group A runs like group A. It's very efficient. Doctrines are set out. Everyone believes the same thing. Group B, Christianity, believes in group B. You know, and it's all sufficient, well run, well oiled, well drilled. No mess. I made sure there's uh, things going on within, there's disciplines here, there, or whatever. But generally, the doctrines are set out for you. This is what we believe. You believe this? Great. You can join our group. Right? But that wasn't the case in the first century. It was very messy. People's lives were messy. Um, it was a, a grace message. was uh, not clearly understood. Paul had to explain it a few times. Even the Apostle Peter said, you know, he said about Paul, he said his message is a bit hard to understand. Can you believe it? Yeah, that's what he said. You can have a look at yourself. Please, don't take my word for it. Have a read yourself what Peter says about Paul's message. <clears throat> so, Ignatius, let's go back to Ignatius. He was a guy, he was a pastor, he had a zeal, and he wanted to preserve unity, just like many of these leaders do today, right? So what he did, he began sort of making a very harmful distinction between pastors, elders, and the, and, um, <clears throat> and the rest of the, the brothers and sisters, which resulted in a hierarchy of a top-down rulership imposed on the body of Christ. And, of course, that distinction is still with us today in different forms. But he was one of the first to make this sharp distinction between bishops, elders, <coughs> excuse me, in the roles, and the authoritative role that they should play. Ignatius was condemned to death by the Roman authorities for simply being a Christian, and as he was escorted to Rome, as the story goes, to be executed, he wrote seven letters to seven different churches, and in his letter to Smyrna, <coughs> he wrote this. He says, Shun divisions as the beginning of evil. Follow your bishop as Jesus Christ followed the Father. And follow your presbyters as the apostles. And respect your deacons as you would respect God's commandment. Let no one do anything in the church apart from the bishop. He, sorry, Holy Communion is valid that's this. Holy Communion is valid when celebrated by the bishop or someone that the bishop authorizes. Where the bishop is present, there let the congregation gather, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the church. So that was one of his letters to Smyrna about 110 AD. <clears throat> now, great. Good on you, Ignatius. Right, back then, you can imagine, he's, he's wanting to look after the body of Christ. There, there's uh, hurtful decisions. But what does he do? He does, he does a thing that we see today. Uh, unfortunately, he, he's, he's made a, a distinction between one, th one group and another. He's given all, he said, all authority. Anything that gets done in, this, uh, in your congregation has to be authorized by one person. Do you believe that? 110 AD. <clears throat> this 
distinction between a bishop and an elder. And what's interesting is in the New Testament, there's no distinctions, right? There's none. But in Ignatian, Ignatius was formulating this <coughs> idea. Um, and some, not long after possibly the, the apostles had died, right? So he was talking like this and he it's in his letters, it's in his letter. Um, and so that is different to what the New Testament writes because interchangeably these uh, roles, if you like, or these uh, people with gifts, uh, there's no difference between an elder and a bishop, basically. You, you know, and these were gifts given to people. But around 180 AD, um, what Ignatian started started to become more accepted by about 180 AD as the norm, right? So now here you have the body of Christ start now putting people in these positions. Oh, you're, you're a bishop or, oh, you know, you're a, you're a pastor. Okay, well, this is your office. This is what you're required to do. <clears throat> now, this is how the apostles did it. They would have thought this, right? Because of writings like this from Ignatius. So it became accepted. And so what happened? By the 3rd century, this was in place. 3rd century, solidly in place. The bishop served as a sole leader in the local assembly. And this top-down direction from him became just part of everyday living. Um, and, and the elders took a secondary role. <laughs> right? So now those who were elders... So these were just gifts, but now they become positions, and this is what this position. Now, Justin Martyr, <clears throat> about 2nd century, uh, preferred to call the single bishop the president of the brothers. Uh, so, you know, you can see it's, it's continuing on now. <clears throat> the, the bishop came to possess sole authority in the church and slowly became the focal point in the church. He led corporate worship, oversaw church discipline, appointed people, appointed new bishops, elders, and, you know, did all the baptizing, all that sort of stuff, and the Lord's Supper. And so by Constantine, 4th century AD, well, what happened? It was full-blown, as you can see, these huge meetings they were having, discussing Trinity and whatever other subject that they wanted to talk about. But their roles, it was between them only, between these uh, men in offices, right? <clears throat> and the pastor, by the 4th century, became a state-sanctioned, professional paid position, and it continues in the same form today. Many pastors or leaders have a, uh, it's a professional paid position. <clears throat> Now, this is looking now, looking at this past history. This is where it all began, guys. Now, you can do your own research, of course. Um, but these roles of pastor, elder, blah, 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 whatever it is today, whatever your governing body, <clears throat> these are all man-made. These are not from the Lord. No, these, these one-time gifts that were established have then were turned into something to try and keep the unity, right? It's interesting. It's like the unity. Let's keep the unity. In my old, old organization, it's all about unity, you know, uh, unity in thought, unity in, in, in whatever you believe, unity. And this is why you couldn't express yourself and, and have any disagreements with anybody. You can't, right? <laughs> Otherwise, they'd see you as disloyal going against the organization, blah, 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 right? Or whatever you want to say. This top-down authority stifled, started to stifle all members within the, the, the body of Christ or the flock. <clears throat> Reality is, dealing with divisions can get ugly. It was ugly in the first century. Uh, but the remedy by Ignatian, Ignatius, uh, for disunity in the church was to implement, reorganize, and restructure the leadership 
you know, like a leadership. And by infusing it with a dominating authority power foreign to the New Testament uh, writers, uh, to the to the way Jesus had simply put it. And so it, by insisting that everyone submit to this <coughs> caused a hell of a problems for the rest of the body of Christ. Notice what he said. Follow your bishop as Jesus Christ followed the Father and follow the, your presbyters or elders as the apostles. This creates an environment in the body of Christ that is both overwhelmingly burdensome and ripe for abuse in the wrong hands. And to aid it, and the statements he said, let no one do anything in the church apart from the bishop and holy communion is valid when celebrated by the bishop or someone that the bishop authorizes. And so we find this now, this top-down authority all the way started by this one man's, well, I can't say it's exactly him, but he was certainly one of the writings, early writings, that made a distinction and gave authority to somebody that didn't should never ever had any type of authority like this. Poor laity, poor people. <clears throat> you know, the, the 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 children of God suffered, started to suffer because of this. <clears throat> we can think of what Jesus said. He said, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? So for the sake of your tradition, you have made the made void the word of God. And hasn't this been the true? Like when you think about this top-down structure within the religion, hasn't that made the word of God void? This type of a tradition. <clears throat> so how do we sort this uh, stuff out? The New Testament uses the terms just by review. Um, maybe you already know the answer to this. It's very simple, right? <coughs> but the New Testament um, uses the terms pastor, elder, bishop, overseer, whatever role you want to put it. Um, they all refer to the same basic person. And it's a gift. Now, here's, here's a, 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 a quote from a scripture taken from Acts 20, 17 and 28 says, Now from Miletus, he, Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. He says this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock. Notice this next point, he says, In which <clears throat> the Holy Spirit has made you overseas to care for the church, or the ecclesia, of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So this scene here, Paul's final farewell to the Ephesians. What does he do? He calls for and meets with the elders of the church. <clears throat> it's important to note that this word is always in the plural, never in a singular. It's never referring to one person like Pastor Russell or President or Judge Rutherford or whoever, or now it's the governing body, <clears throat> as they've changed it over the years, or Pastor this or Pastor that. <clears throat> no, it's always in a plural. <clears throat> uh, Acts 14, 23, Acts 15, 6, 1, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 17, Tim Titus 1, 5, James 5, 14, 1 Peter 5, 1 are the references. So this idea of a sole person or senior elder or whatever it is, is foreign. It is foreign to the New Testament. Also, what Paul is saying here to the elders, he's talking about them being gifted by the Holy Spirit as church overseas. So the, the Holy Spirit appointed these men uh, as gifts, or I gave them gifts, <clears throat> as overseas. These elders, uh, the, if you like, the church overseas, you know, whatever, your, your translation may say bishop. So to oversee or bishop the church in this context, notice, as Paul put it, means to watch over and protect the flock from wolves. Th that's basically it. You know, um, because wolves wanting to destroy the flock or pollute the flock or pollute the gospel, the grace gospel, the message. And we know that these wolves merge from within. 
okay so <clears throat> and of course from outside but you know this is where they're coming from so these men who, who had gifts by the Holy Spirit were there to what to protect to oversee right oversee the gospel that the gospel is true that hasn't been corrupted <clears throat> And so these uh, people or this group, um, this gifts in men, was reinforced to Titus, where he says in um, Titus 1, 5, 7, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what, um, what remained into order and appointed elders in every town as I directed you for an overseer as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or of greedy gain. So Paul left Titus in Crete to tie up some loose ends, as we can see, from these newly planted congregations, namely to appoint elders in that area, elders in plural. <clears throat> Again, he uses this term elder and overseer, um, in different parts. So when you look at it, elders equals overseers, elders equals bishops, overseers equals bishops, etc. Um, these are same elders are also the church's shepherds and or pastors. For example, in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 3, it says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, <coughs> excuse me, among you. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, <coughs> as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in charge of you, but being examples to the flock. Peter follows the same pattern of plurality in addressing the elders, if you like, of the ecclesia, as Paul did. But he does something a little different here. He uses overseer, that is bishop, as an action of, overs of exercising oversight. So the elders as overseers are to exercise oversight at a local assembly, local meeting, right? Overseeing has to do with protecting. That's what we must understand. That's what overseeing means. Overseeing has to do with protecting the church from those who, who would seek to corrupt the new covenant gospel of grace. Um, if you don't believe that, that that is the case, think about today. What message do you believe? Do you believe in the new covenant grace message? Or is your message tainted with a whole bunch of you know, um, conditional salvation, conditional works. You must do this, you must do that, or else you will never be saved. And so the only way you can do that is if you stick with us, our group, we got it right. All right we have our top-down structure. We've got our doctrines all set out. You are never really saved, not even till the end of the end of the end. Somewhere, even then, we don't know if you're going to be saved. But, you know, you've got a good chance if you stick with us. This is the corrupt Corrupt message, corrupt gospel. If you're hearing a works-based gospel, conditional-based salvation, I believe that is a corrupted version. And many Christian re religions have adopted this. Whereas these men, these apostles were saying, hey, elders, gifts, you got these gifts, you have the spirit within you, and you've been given an extra gift to look after the flock, and especially this message. It, this message is gold, friends. The new covenant gospel of grace is gold. <clears throat> you as a believer, if you know you're a child of God and you understand God's grace to mean that you're totally forgiven of all your sins, past, present and future, right? And you have salvation today. You have eternal life today. You've been perfected by Christ, for Christ. You are the righteousness of God. You are totally justified, sanctified. I mean, that, that is a message you're not hearing. You're hearing in a, a corrupted version that tells you you're not good enough. God's going to get you. Make sure you do, you know, you, you, you know, uh, say all your sins, you know, confess all your sins. Don't, there's a healthy place for that. But Christ died once. 
He's not going up and down to do it again every time you sin. I, I, I better do it again. <laughs> no, guys, it, it's done. <clears throat> and so what we've done here is just gone through these, you know, the, there's no separation with these roles. These are gifts. It's really uh, interchangeable. It's referring to the, the same gifted person, have the same sort of uh, uh, a mindset to to protect the gospel within the body of Christ because it is based on love. And the grace gospel, grace message is based on love. Right? It's not based on rules and regulations and policy that needs to be um, addressed from the top down. Now, this is all corporate worship that began way back there. Thanks, Ignatius. I know you love the flock, man but you put it on the wrong course, right? <clears throat> Again, the idea of elders also being the, the church of shepherds and pastors takes us right back to Ephesians 4.11 where it says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers. Again, some translations will say pastors and teachers. So what can we conclude? The elders of the church are also its overseers or bishops as evidenced by the exercising of oversight. So, <clears throat> it's interesting. Uh, we will develop this series in part two. Now, how has that, and we said it right from the beginning, how has this understanding now, now we've got this understanding, uh, let me find the questions, <clears throat> What has the centuries of this centrality of the pastor and, and, and uh, now different dominations have using their own titles, have you know, gone away from pastor to church leaders to senior pastors to um, governing body members, etc. How has that practice, what has that done to the body of Christ? Has it basically this institutional... Um, center of the governing body or the, the pastor has that uh, crippled the body of Christ and in what way how has that crippled you you as a member of the body of Christ I'd like to finish off with uh, Jesus words just as a reminder <coughs> of what what he had in mind just as a reminder but Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Just underline that word. It shall, that sentence, not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you should be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave even as the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many again he said it shall not be so among you like those gentiles who have a top-down structure that's not how the body of christ is remember he is the head and we are the body thanks uh for listening <coughs> and uh um, my next video will be whenever I get a chance. I'm on a bit of a holiday, a bit of a break. And so i uh, do that. But I, it's a very important topic I think we need to address as the body of Christ. So that we not, so we understand why this, uh, why people are leaving, why people are dissatisfied. It is because this very institution had its Bases, although maybe intentionally came from a good place, it ended up becoming a really uh, terrible thing uh, by putting in offices where they, these gifts from the Holy Spirit were there just to help protect the flock, uh, preserve the grace gospel. That's what its role was. That's what the role of these men would have been doing preserving the grace gospel protecting individuals right not telling them how to live their lives no protecting the grace gospel 
sure, we can always recommend things to people, but we're not telling people how to live their lives. It's messy. Christ, you know, believers, are, it's messy, friends, right? Let it go. <laughs> Christ will take care of it. You know, Christ will take care of it. We don't need to judge each other. You know, we can help each other, but, you know, if we're believers, we're okay. We have the Spirit of God in us. It's just trying to understand this indwelling Spirit and Christ in us, which is mentioned over 80 times. So Christ is working through each individual. It's a personal thing now. We're part of the family, and he's dealing with us one-on-one. On one. You can't get a better teacher. <clears throat> Thanks for your time. Talk to you soon, okay? Take care.